All right, everyone, we're going to get started. Sorry, we're a few minutes, running a few minutes late. Technology is such a wonderful thing, right? So a few housekeeping things to start off with. Your most important and valuable tool that you'll have today, other than your brain and your ears, will be the agenda book. Okay, so each of you should have received one of these inside it. It is going to detail out each breakout. So we have six rooms here today and tomorrow that will have breakout sessions. This is the general session room. So whenever we have a general session like this morning, this is the room you're going to come back to. Otherwise, if you look up, there's Entrada AB, which is this room. Entrada C, Sunbrook ABC, and the auditorium so they they are around there there is a map on the back to help find your way uh, if you're like me though it probably won't help but anyway just follow follow someone I guess you know you'll learn something it doesn't matter where you wind up right okay so that that is your your kind of your key inside also there is a short little summary of each of the presentations to give you an idea to kind of figure out what you'd like to do, what you want to listen to, things like that, okay? And then there's the speaker bios as well, so you can learn a little bit more about the presenters we have. We have a great group of presenters for this uh, workshop. We've, we have worked hard to try and bring in some of the best we could find, and I think we found them. And so we have producers from around the region as well as Jimmy Emmons and Jill Clapperton who've come in you know, from other parts of the country to, to share their story with us. So we're excited to have them here. Now, unfortunately, there is a few changes though on the agenda. Um, Matt Yost is one of the presenters from USU. He's in COVID quarantine as of yesterday. So he's not gonna make it and we, we didn't have enough time to switch. If you want to see me sing and dance, maybe we can do that, but I, I would highly not recommend that, okay? So we'll just, you'll just have to pick another presentation in one of the other rooms. We should have plenty of room to be able to do that. Um, then as well, uh, Evan DeMarco from uh, Regenerative Pastures was not able to make it, but AJ Richards is, is his partner. He's here in, in his stead. So that is one the other change. Now we are live streaming this, uh, the camera in the back, you know, so don't get up here up front and do anything that you don't want put on the internet. All right, okay. Last, lastly, Commissioner Butters was supposed to come and welcome you all here but you get my lovely face instead. He wasn't able to make it, so welcome. Thank you for coming. We really appreciate you taking the time. I know a lot of you had to, had to leave the farm and the ranch and leave someone in charge, and as we all know, once you step foot off of it, something's probably already broken, and you're gonna have to fix it when you get back. But thank you for coming here. So Commissioner, did he did leave a, uh, he's got a little welcome video that he had pre-recorded for us, so I'm gonna play that for you now. Crossing my fingers that it will work. There. Welcome, Welcome to the to Soil, Soil Health in the West, West Conference. Conference. I'm, sorry I'm sorry that I could that not, I could be, not there be there in person, person to join you, join you. But, I'm but I'm glad that so, that so many of you are there, are there discussing, discussing such an such important, important topic. topic. I'm Craig, I'm Craig Butters, Butters Commissioner, Commissioner of Agriculture, of Agriculture and, and Food in the state of state Utah. Of Utah. I grew up I grew on a dairy farm, farm in Cache Valley and raised, and raised my family, my family there. there. I know the I know importance, importance of proper, proper soil, soil management. management. Agriculture, Agriculture is at the is heart, at the heart of, Utah's of Utah's history. history. From, the From the time the pioneers, the pioneers settled, settled our great, our great state, state until now, now this, heritage this heritage has been has built, built upon a great foundation, foundation. A, foundation a foundation of fertile, fertile soil. soil. The Utah, the Utah Department, Department of Agriculture, Agriculture and Food recognizes the importance of being, being stewards, stewards of the land and protecting, and protecting our, natural our natural resources for future, future generations, generations to, benefit. to benefit. In 2021, our soil, our soil health, health program, program was created, was created to, to recognize soil health, health as, essential as essential to protecting, to protecting the state's state soil, soil and water resources, water resources. Bolstering, bolstering state, state food, supply, food supply, and sustaining, and sustaining the state's agricultural, agricultural industry. industry. We will continue, we will continue to, work to work as a department, as a department to ensure, to ensure that, that soil health, health is a priority, is a priority so, our so our agricultural, agricultural heritage, heritage can, continue can continue 
for many, for many generations, generations to come. To come. I hope that I you hope enjoy, you enjoy your, time your time at the conference, at the conference and, find and find the information, the information there helpful, helpful in, your in your efforts to protect, to protect the, health the health of the soil, of the soil in, the West. in the West. Thank you, Thank very, you much. very much. The other thing we want to definitely um, make sure that we thank is our sponsors. So they have, a lot of them have a booth in our vendor hall, in the exhibit hall. During the breaks and things like that, I encourage you to go in there, visit their booths, talk to them. They made this event possible. Uh, you know, it may not seem it on the registration fee that, uh, that it uh, didn't need sponsors, but you guys basically, your registration's feeding you and they are making sure that everything else works. And so this kind of events, they do, they do take a lot of resources and, and we are happy that they're willing to, to support us and that. So if you do get a chance to, thank them for making this possible. Um, I realize I didn't introduce myself. I thought everybody knowed me, so, but. So I'm Tony Richards. I am the program manager for the soil health program in UDAF. Um, and so we do have a few UDAF employees around in, you'll see us in our, in our t-shirts and stuff. So if you do have questions about soil health program, talk to them, not me, but you know, or however you want to do it. You know, we're here, we've got questions. There are, there are new programs that we're coming out with, you know, in UDAF to help push soil health forward. So we'd love to talk to you about those as well. All right. Well, you don't want to hear a whole lot more from me. So I'm gonna introduce our first speaker. So Jimmy Emmons is here. I'm gonna read his bio. So he is a international leader in the soil health movement and Jimmy serves on the regional, is a regional coordinator for the USDA's Farm Production and Conservation Program. He recently joined the Oklahoma Conservation Commission as a soil health mentor coordinator and Jimmy and his wife, Ginger, manage over 2,000 acres of cropland and 5,000 acres of range with regenerative agricultural techniques in Dewey County, Oklahoma. <clears throat> and through their annual rainfall is in tw around 20 inches or give or take 20 inches. So like if he's like Utah, it's zero. So we feel his pain. And uh, Jimmy has received Oklahoma's first Leopold Conservation Award back in 2017. I was able, fortunately enough, to listen to Jimmy speak at No-Till on the Plains a few years ago, and I, I am excited for us being able to bring him to Utah. So we want to start off, give Jimmy a hand, and we'll, we'll get rolling. So. Well, if we we'll, don't blow up the machine here, we'll get started in just a second. It's uh, great to be here in Utah. And uh, I do live in a 20 inch rainfall environment, give or take 20 inches. Uh, literally nowadays that whiplash weather, and that's what most climatologists are telling us that is, we can go from one extreme to the other at a, at a very high rapid rate. And so, you know, in 2011, we had around seven inches and in 2012, we had nine inches. And then in 2014, we had 25.3 the month of May. So, okay. Sorry, if you're gonna be tied here. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. So, I am a recovering tillage addict. I grew up with heavy tillage. My granddad, my great granddad, my granddad, my dad were all tillage guys, and uh, we were good at it. We were very good at it. Just keep going, huh? You're making me nervous. When people walk behind me, I get nervous. Well, I know you do. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we've learned a better way. Uh, I'm, I'm still recovering, though, because uh, every time I see a, a till field every once in a while, I get this twitch, you know, and so I want to say, man, that looks good. Uh, but I know better now, and that's what we're going to talk about this morning when Tony gets us up and running here. Okay, yeah, once is enough. Yeah. Well, anybody know some one-line jokes? We'll get started, so. 
I guess I could I introduce Marlon. He had some good one-liners yesterday at the field day. And what a great day uh, yesterday out in the field here. We really enjoyed that. The only regret I had was not being here the day before like I was supposed to be, but I got caught up coming from uh, Orlando, Florida, and uh, didn't make my one flight into St. George yesterday. So now we'll try to get started here. Uh, the recovering tillage attic, one of the things is uh, Ginger and I, in one hired hand, Carson Libo, I hired Carson when he was 15 in uh, high school to start working for me, and uh, it's been a really, really good relationship. He's been with us for 14 years now, and uh, looks to be for a while, so we're really excited about it. You know, good people can make bad or harmful decisions if the systems which they're making those decisions are properly designed, poorly, poorly designed. You know, I, I know them firemen uh, didn't intend for that to happen. And you know, everything we do on the land has a consequence, and so we need to think about uh, them consequences. And so what we're gonna talk about this morning is how we look at that. Methods to evaluate. So if we're gonna change our system, and really start to looking at, at how do we have better soil health. There are some things that we really need to do. We need to look at nature. We tried to yesterday talk about walking over to the edge of the field, uh, undisturbed ground that hadn't been disturbed. That's where you kind of need to look and see what Mother Nature's telling you is possible. You know, I'm a tillage addict, so I need to look at tillage. Is, is that something that, that would fit in my scenario, or is it no-till? or no-till with cover crops. You know, I started cover crops in 2012, right in the middle of the drought, and uh, that was a learning curve. And then no-till and cover crops with livestock. So I am a rancher as well. I'm actually the rancher. Uh, they call me the rancher, but my wife is actually the herdsman. She loves the cows uh, by far more than I do. I really love the land and I love growing crops. Uh, but I get labeled as the rancher. One more time. One more time. We're good, but the people online can't see us. Oh, well, if we, they can't see me, maybe that's really good. Yeah, I think that was probably the, <laughs> probably the best. I'm sorry, Jim. You, you're ruining my momentum, but it's okay. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> You know, that's the, the great thing about being first, is you can be the guinea pig or it really runs well. So I'm working on the assumption it's really gonna run well here in a minute. Okay, <laughs> I'm giving him a hard time. He does better under pressure. I, I don't. All right, we're not. Okay. So we'll get back to where we was here. So then we look at nature's methods. You know, what, what did Mother Nature do before we were here? You know, she had no mechanical disturbance. She had armor on the soil surface. She cycled water. She had diverse living plants, diverse animal life, nutrient cycling, thousands of years of research and development, and it was very dynamic and very complex. You know, that's what we need to really consider is what Mother Nature was doing before us. You know, the Creator, He made this really self-sustaining, interconnected, regenerative, and functioning. If you really think about Mother Nature, it was really doing very, very well before we got here. I mean, it everything worked. We didn't have to have synthetic inputs. We didn't have to have synthetic fertilizer. And you know, it was really growing and really doing well. So can we use farming in nature's image? You know, yes we can. But that's where the cover crops come in to reduce the haul off. Mother nature, everything grows up, it cycles, falls down, recycles, and goes back in. In agriculture, in our modern world, we've gotta haul off something because we wanna, we gotta make a living. So that's where cover crops come in. So is there really any difference here? The moon on the right and till soil on the left. You know, really the only difference here, you know, it's absent life other than the people that walked on it. 
You know, 12 years ago, I, just quite honestly, I didn't really understand what below our feet out in the field was really the true key to our success. Millions and billions of life forms working for us for free to cycle them nutrients to make them available for us. That never crossed our mind in the beginning. You know, we were more worried about what we could grow above ground and take off and take to the, to the market. So as we looked at the till method here, <coughs> tillage it increases, food biology it increases respiration, but it's depleting soil organic matter and CO2 goes into the atmosphere. And you can start on down through here of all the inputs that tillage really has to use. And today, if we want to really look at the cost of inputs, that's another discussion. I mean, anywhere from 40 to 100 to 150, 200% uh, increase in the inputs. And so it's very important for us to start looking at really how things are functioning and how we can do with less. And I'm going to show you uh, what we've been able to do on our farm as well. So if we want to look at till, and, and I've actually seen some corn crops in soils like this, uh, and it makes it very, very challenging to grow a good crop in that. But the pros here, I, I don't see very many. And, and I'm gonna show you a little bit why uh, I don't see that. As we look at the cons, you know, less C for the microbes, carbon, uh, the color of the soil is lightened. You know, everybody will tell you in, in Oklahoma, our soils are red. Uh, and I'm gonna show you that that is true as a whole, but it doesn't have to be that way. You know, it destroys biological life, destroys structure. Have you ever thought if uh, you had a tent on the ground and was living there and someone come along and pulled a vertical tillage disc or a moldboard plow through your tent, you know, what would happen? <laughs> your life would be turned upside down and, and in that process, of course, if you was in the tent, there might be loss of life. So you got to think about that a little bit. If you're the soil microbiome and you're working, and here comes that thing, huge piece of implement tilling, what that can really do. And it goes on down the list of cons, and there, there are plenty. Uh, you know, decreased infiltration, I'm going to talk about that uh, more as we go along, and, and how that's really, really important. To, to get into the next level. Now the no-till method, as you see here, uh, there's a lot less disturbance. There's also a lot less inputs at times needed here to make this work. You keep a living plant with roots, it's cycling, but you have this fallow period in between. And that's where I started uh, to begin with with no-till and I still had this clean till mentality uh, in my mind that this is the way it needed to be. We didn't need to leave anything growing because it's going to use water because where I'm at, much like y'all, we're very, very dependent on every drop. And uh, then we grow another crop. And anytime soil is, uh, is vacant of living roots, it's degrading. That's what we got to think about because that biology has to live and it has to eat. And if we don't have them roots in the ground, then it has nothing to eat. So no-till with covers. We got the, the nutrient uh, soil health accelerator there, the cow. Any animals, if you remember on the prairie, there are lots of diverse life on the prairie. And they just really help cycle the nutrients quicker and make it work a lot better. Now, can we all have animals on the land? Probably not across America. There's some challenges with that. But there's things we can do with manures and other amendments that can semi-replace her, but you can't really replace the total impact of what an animal does with grazing and the saliva, much less the urine and the manure that's coming out. But you see the cover crop there in the middle, in that fallow period, uh, and I'm gonna talk later this afternoon about profits of grazing where I can show you that a great return the grazing can do with cover crops as well. But you start filling in that void, it becomes more alive and everything keeps cycling very well. 
still having issues. You're really messing with my momentum now. I know. You, you like me to have challenges, don't you? Yeah. Okay. We're, we're challenged together. Yeah. Constantly, yeah. Who loves modern technology? <laughs> Who loves the challenges with modern technology? You know, that's, that's the world we're in nowadays, though, is, is this technology can really be beneficial. It's very frustrating at times and very challenging uh, when we have issues like this going on. But once again, if you got a good technician, mm -hmm. uh, which you don't, <laughs> <laughs> this can go very smoothly. We'll, we'll be at the comedy club tonight <laughs> if you guys want to join in. Well, late sometimes. <laughs> After happy hour, <laughs> so. <laughs> Let's see. Let's see if you can do a ventriloquist act and talk while you're drinking. Mm -hmm. That's right. We gotta get all our people online that's watching uh, to see the slides as we go as well. So we are very dry at home right now. Uh, we've been about 190 days since we've had any measurable precipitation, much like looks like around here. A lot of our winter wheat is really, really struggling. Uh, used to could row it pretty good. Uh, I, I'd like to think it's taking a little nap and trying to conserve its resources. We do have a little chance of snow and rain at home uh, tomorrow night, and so we're really looking forward to that. So we're going to try this again. So <clears throat> here's where we were when we left off. So now we're starting to fill in all them voids in that, that fallow period. We're having a good cover crop working. Everything's starting to cycle, and it's looking so much better. So then when we really look at, at the whole cycle, we have a no-till uh, cash crop planted. We maintain that cash crop. We harvest it, and then we plant a cover crop right behind it. Now, in water-challenged areas, that becomes uh, more challenging. But we do know that immediately after you harvest that cereal grain or that crop, whatever it is, where it's silage or whatever, planting in the next few hours or day after you harvest that is critical because every hour that that canopy is opened up, we're losing water. And your stand success depends on that, that you know, top two inches. And so the quicker you can get that in, the more success we have. Now, can I always get that done? There's technology things that, that come along and hired hand things in life. And so sometimes we're challenged as well, but that's the goal we like to be harvesting and planting at the same time. Now, we graze our cover crop because we have around 300 mother cow operation. So I've got plenty of animals that's ready to eat something really nutritious. And when these summer covers are growing, that's normally our hottest months is July and August. We're very challenged just like y'all are with heat. And so it really gives our native range a, a really nice break to kind of recover before going into the winter months. Then we allow that to regrow if we got water. If we don't, we're going to have to terminate that. And if we're really challenged with water, we may not even be able to graze that because the longer that grows and it gets going into reproductive as you're grazing it, it's going to use more water. So we really have to manage our water, just like y'all do here. And that plays a role in all this cover crops. And sometimes I'll even sacrifice another cash crop if I got a great opportunity to make some money off some calves grazing and go ahead and use that water that's available then and maybe cycle into a different crop. Then we terminate that cover crop and we have a pretty complete cycle that's overall soil health is accelerating and it's a really a functioning system now back 
once again, kind of mimicking Mother Nature, that ongoing living root in there. And, you know, always uh, Mother Nature struggles with droughts and floods and everything else. So there is some things that's give or take in there. So to look at the cover crops and livestock component, that, that's all the pros that I see that's available in there. It's 24 seven, it's feeding the microbes. The soil becomes very resilient. That's very important to understand the resiliency that we can build into this higher biological population. The more people I've got working for me that's working to help me, the better off I am. It's a team concept, so I want that biological family really doing well. We talked about this yesterday, how aggregates are formed, and you keep coming back, Tony. I know. This is a recurring theme. It is. This is not part of the presentation, so you're going to have to tell me. So, you know, it, it's very important to, to understand that big cycle of life that's really working for us. That even, it, you got to understand, when you put synthetic fertilizers out, it has to go through the cycle through the biological community before it's available. And so the less of them you have, the more inefficient you are at getting the fertilizer that you put on in use. Worldwide, nitrogen only is about 50% efficient. 33%, 50 percent in the United States, 33% worldwide. So I tell everybody, if you were at the gas pump and your vehicle was out, and you paid for a full fill up and you got ready to leave the gas station and you were only at a half a tank, would you leave? Would you be content? No, we wouldn't. We'd be going back in and raising all sorts of cane uh, with that. And we're gonna try this one more time. Okay. I'm just picking on him. They're doing a really good job. Uh, let's see, where was he? Decreased erosion and runoff. That's a big, big problem across the United States. We're still exporting down our streams 1.69 billion tons of topsoil a year. 1.69 billion tons a year. It's our largest export more than any other thing. So we gotta do better with that and we can. You know, benefits from manure and urine, increase soil organic matter. Soil organic matter is the key to really understanding what we can do. More pore space, armor on the soil. We talked about that, the great Marlin talked about that yesterday, and mimics nature. The, con the cons though, it's complex and, re and requires a lot more management. You know, early on when I was growing up, it was pretty, it was pretty easy because we knew when we were gonna plant winter wheat, we knew when we were going to fertilize going into the fall. We knew when we were going to take off grazing if we grazed it. We knew when we were going to top dress. And we knew within a week or two or three when we were going to harvest. And we started to cycle all again. It was a pretty easy cycle for us. This takes more management, more thinking. Fence and water infrastructure. And I'm going to talk about that in a breakout session this afternoon. Biomass management. You know, to start with, I was scared to death of the, the biomass. Like, I can't plan in that. You know, it's overwhelming. You know, I've never, I never planned anything that's six foot tall or cab tall. And I'll show you later uh, some of them videos this afternoon as well. I, <clears throat> I work with a, a, a large dairy at home called Brahms Farms. And they have lots of retail stores in several states. And they started to cover crops and I was helping them plant their cereal rye. And I'll never forget this phone conversation it was come planting time, I got this call, and Jim says, Jimmy, you're getting me fired. I'm, I'm, I've been working here 35 years. It's all your fault. You're going to get me fired. I was like, what's wrong, Jim? He said, I can't plan into this biomass. It's too much. Now, they have a 92-foot wide, 48-row planter with a 600-horse tractor in front of it. And I know this planter can plant through virtually anything. It's, real, it's really good piece of equipment. And I asked Jim, I said, tell me what's wrong. Is this row cleaners? You wrap and da 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 da. And, and he just kept going on and on. He just wouldn't go through it. And he wouldn't answer my question. And finally I said, dang it, Jim, tell me what's wrong. 
And he said, well, I can't get through these windrows. It's like, windrows, windrows. Why do you have windrows? Well, it was so big I couldn't get through it, so I started mowing. I said, stop mowing. He said, oh, I did. We started disking. But, but we, got, we got to disk it four times. And I said, Jim, stop disking. He said, I did, because it's, now it's too dry to plant. <laughs> and I said, back to my original question 10 minutes ago, tell me what's wrong with the planter. And it got really, really quiet on the other end, and then I knew. I said, you haven't even tried it yet. And he said, no, because it, it won't go through it. He said, I kind of broke your rules a little bit when I was planting. I said, well, tell me more. He said, you told me to plant 70, 80 pounds, and I got to figuring up we had enough for 140 pounds, and so I planted 140 pounds, and we irrigated it. We had plenty of water, and now it's six to seven foot tall, and it's so thick a jackrabbit can't even walk through it. And I said, that's an awesome problem. Oh, man, great. Uh, pull across the road, start planting, and tell me what's wrong. In the meantime, I'm going to send you videos of me planning, videos of Adam Doherty in Tennessee and Russell Hedrick in North Carolina planting and stuff much more dense than that. And within about an hour, he sent me a picture. The planter was going through it. And then the call was, now what do I do? And then we talked about roller crimping. But that's the way I was early on. It's like, how do I manage the biomass? You know, it, it's going to require faith and patience. And Jimmy wasn't very patient in the beginning. Because we want it now. We've got to have it now. And some things are not now. We, we've got to learn some patience, and we've got to learn what to look for. But it also requires understanding and commitment. And we really got to understand that. That that commitment, you got to be all in. And you got to try to, like Jim, refuse to get to the real ant, the real problem to figure out because he wasn't committed to pull in there and try to make a mess and see what was wrong. So where the animals go, the nutrients flow. They make it flow a lot quicker. 80% of the nutrients consumed go back into the soil. So you become more efficient on your nutrients. Which method is going to be the really to rejuvenate our soil, to regenerate it. So we're going to look at them. Here's all that we looked at. We looked at nature. We looked at no-till and cover crops and livestock, just covers, no-till and till. And we want to be fungal dominant instead of bacteria dominant. We want that fungal component in there. We want diversity. Remember, at the edge of the rows and out in the pastures in the National Forest here, there's lots of diversity. And we want biomass. We want that armor. The great Marlin talked about that yesterday. We've got to have the armor to keep it really protected. So when we get them big winds, we had winds in western Oklahoma and Kansas and Colorado of 109 miles an hour in December. And, boy, if you don't have it anchored, you're going to lose it. And them extreme things, we really got to have that biomass. And it's got to be complex. It can't be this simple because we do simple very good. We do a lot of mono across the country. But we also got to have benefits. We got to pay the banker. We got to pay the, the mortgage. We got to make a living. We got to eat. So if we're going to have all them, what do we need to look at? We better look at no-till and covers and cover crops with livestock in some form or fashion to be successful. Making the same decision multiple times without change is no longer a decision. It just becomes a choice. That's where we were 12 years ago. It was just a choice. There's no decisions to be made. We knew we were wheat farmers, and we were going to plant wheat. And we, like I said, we had that time all figured out in this great big circle. So the question for y'all today is, do you truly have the desire to make the land better? I think every one of us would say yes, we do. We want our children, our grandchildren. Even if we don't have children and grandchildren, we want the young that's going to take over or the next land manager 
to have a decent shot at being successful. So I think we could all answer that in here. You got to remember, though, where there's life, there's hope. When it's alive, you got a shot. When it's dead, all odds are against you. And sometimes when all odds are against us, we feel like, well, it hadn't rained, and we're in a drought, and, you know, I've done all I can do. Or it's, it's rained too much, or there's not enough snowpack, there's not enough water in the ditch. And we try to find all sorts of reasons why it's not working. And we're going to talk about what I have changed on my farm and why now it works better as we go through here. And we're going to start, and this is exactly what it used to look like at Emmons Farms. And I've seen quite a bit of this flying in from, well, I've been, I left Oklahoma, I left the farm uh, 10 days ago. I went to Maryland and Delaware and done two conferences there. Then I went to Orlando and done a conference, and then from Orlando to Phoenix and from Phoenix to here. And so I've seen plenty of this across the country, trust me. We're, I'm, but here's the basic things. We've managed to cut our fuel costs from $128,000 a year to 20. Now, budgets today, if I could cut out $100,000, that would be a positive thing because things are it's pretty hard right now. And I've also reduced my fertilizer and chemicals by 85%. You say that's not possible. Well, it's all possible. It just takes time and patience. Weed suppression is all about planting another seed. It's not about getting rid of a seed. It's about planting another seed. And here's just kind of a shot what my neighbors would do on the left here with tillage pass system. They would deep tillage it because you have this compaction layer. You would disc that mulch, that, get that straw in the ground. You'd run chisel sweeps. You'd cultivate. You'd fertilize. You'd recultivate plant. You'd top dress. And that would cost you when I'd done this, and that's not current because that would probably be double or triple today just because of the cost of everything going up but in that snapshot it was about 125 dollars an acre me on the right i would spray and burn down after harvest if i had weeds if i don't i don't worry about it and if I, if it's a weed that i can graze i don't worry about it i'll plant a cover crop in there unless they're too thick then i'll do that spray burn down Seed cost, I try to keep that cheap on a summer mix, around $18 an acre. We know now it's a little bit more. This past year was about 20. Uh, when we, we use our fertilizer, we'll use a humic source with all nitrogen. If we're putting on any nitrogen, we'll use a humic with it to decrease the impact on the biological community. Gets down to $104, so I'm, I'm actually 25 bucks cheaper right there. But then I can turn around and graze that, and I always capture $85 an acre up to $200 and some dollars an acre with my cattle. Being conservative here, I just showed an $85. That gets my cost down to $19 an acre. Now you don't think I can't compete with the neighbors a little bit? Yeah, I can. And can we do that? Or is this just Jimmy's numbers? Well, here's Russell Hedricks in North Carolina. He's reduced his herbicide spraying time and money and running the equipment depreciation. 500 acres of corn, no post spray, no post spray on 400 acres of beans. Chemical savings about 20,000 uh, bucks. By using the Haney test, he's reduced his use of phosphorus, potassium, and nitrogen. He's saving 91,000 bucks a year. Once again, another 100000 You start moving that type of money out of that bottom line, it makes it a lot better. And so now we get to the Emmons Farm and the journey begins. And you say, well, I thought you were no-till. Now, remember when I told you I wasn't very patient and sometimes overwhelming? This is one of the 
first cover crops I grew in the summertime, and we were going to go back to winter canola, and I panicked. Flat dab out. I, I'm going to be honest, I panicked. I was like Jim. I didn't even try it. But they had this new tillage thing coming out called vertical tillage. It'll fix everything. And you don't compact anything because you only pull it about this shallow. And I started to twitch in that, 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 that tillage addict's like, well, it's really not tillage. It's conservation tillage. It'll be okay. And so I bought this thing, and I started pulling it, and immediately I was like an alcoholic having the first drink after 20 years. It's like, man, that looks good. <laughs> this is all right. I'm happy. And then I got to the turn row, and I thought, doggone it. Where's my commitment? I said I was all in. Crap. I done volunteered my farm up in RCS and Noble Research and everybody else to be a demonstration farm, and here I am. And so what I done, I done strips like this. I'm going to do side-by-side -side comparisons. I'm going to prove everybody wrong, and what I've done here is right. And when I harvested that next crop, you know how much more I made where I pulled the tillage? Anybody want to guess? I made two-tenths of a bushel to one bushel difference. And I tell everybody, it's like an anvil fell out of the sky and hit me right smack dab in my bald head. And I thought, crud, I spent $90,000 that I just saved on a new tillage, pulling it with my 380 horsepower tractor to make nothing. And that's when I swore off. I called my dealer back. I said, I've made a mistake. I want to upgrade my, my seating equipment. I traded that, that vertical tillage in, and I bought me a big air seeder that day and got rid of my, my box drill. And right there's the wheat crop. I didn't get the canola planted because the weather didn't cooperate. I wound up planting uh, wheat that year. The wheat looked great, but there, it, it made no money. All I'd done is spent money, and I hate spending money, and I hate spending money worse now than ever because when you spend it, you don't have it. Somebody else does. So then we really started to look inside by side. Cover crops on the right, no cover crops on the left. Look at the difference in the plants. Look at the root mass down there. What diversity is starting to look at you. And by the way, anybody know Jay Fuhrer from North Dakota in here? A few? Yeah. Jay, come and help me do some of this. Once again, cover crops on the right, none on the left. So Jay was at my farm in 2010. After we got started, this was one of the first that we had. And look at on the right, the very first cover crop, what it done for my wheat crop. We split the field in half. I'm doing side by side, and then I'll drill straight through the half down the same drill for 25 foot apart. And look at the riso sheeting now in 2020. Marlon talked about this yesterday and how important that is. That's where the life is. That's where the root exudates are leaking out and feeding the biology that's working for us. If your roots are naked and does, doesn't have that soil stuck to it, then you don't have any activity. This is what we want on the ground. Because sometime or other, Mother Nature is going to give us a big weather event. And we're not going to be ready for it unless we have armor on the ground. It's also a blanket. It's also a water cooler. In the wintertime, it helps us keep it warm to keep the activity growing. In the summertime, it keeps us cool. Here is some of the first data that really changed my mind. And we measured this with NRCS. And where we had cover crops had 7.52 inches of water in the profile and only 4.6 where we kept it bare. 
that was the game changer. But see, I had not thought about all the water that was evaporating. It's so easy to see it coming down and it's so hard to see it leaving because it leaves a quarter inch, three, four, five, six tenths at a time. And a lot of times in July and August, we'll, we'll lose an inch a day. And so I said, we gotta look at this deeper. And what they done, they, they brought out a Giddings probe and they cored down and they took these back to the lab and dried them out and weighed them, that's how we got that data. And then the next year we looked at multiple places and it was just the opposite. And it's like, oh, what's going on here? Well, see, we started to grazing. And like I said earlier, when you start grazing and gets going to reproductive mode, you're gonna use some more water. And so we were a little bit behind, but if you look at the, the blue is when we done in September 30th, February 22nd, we pulled a second set of cores, and what happened then? We had regained what we had lost because we'd caught snow that winter. And, and we were able, because our aggregation is getting better and our soil structure is getting better, when it comes, we can take it in. And so it proved to us, no matter how we ma managed, at the end, when we really need it, we were water ahead. And it continues every year that we measure this. Once we got our system functioning and getting water in, whether it's through irrigation or rainfall, we have more to work with. Because see, when I started in the beginning, my neighbors told me, said, Jimmy, we don't have enough water to grow year round and grow a cover crop and a cash crop. And you know what? They were right. Why? because we had destroyed our soil structure so bad that when it did rain, we weren't able to take it all in. We were running it out of the field. Once I got that fixed and we started capturing it, I had plenty of moisture to do what I needed to do. This next slide is a great friend of mine, Greg Scott, he's a soil scientist. He's been with me all through the, my, my journey I really enjoyed working with Greg. We're down at a neighbor's of mine about 70 miles south of me. This is a cover crop here on the left where the pit, and we just dug that pit. And the only reason that that pit is that shallow is that sand rock below that. That's all the soil he has to work with. This Alamendeman's farm here. And I want you to look at the boundaries around that. He didn't smooth that off with the bucket when he done it. So there was a lot of berms around the edge of that. And when we finished the field day and I started driving home, there was a thunderstorm coming up. And in a little bit, I got this phone call from Greg and Alan that were still there. Now, folks, that water did not run in the surface into the pit. You'll notice there was no ditches over that berm around that pit. The water had went through the correct water cycle. It fell down into the cover crop area and, and the earthworms and the root holes and the soil structure was so good, it went down in the profile and it came out the least resistance by the pit. And so water came into the pit from underground. That's when you know your, your cycle is fixed. Alan had been doing this about 20 years. He's ahead of me. He was one of my mentors. And so it, it really excites me when things like this happen. And so did any, who all went yesterday to the, to the beginning workshop? Okay. I got there late. Did Marlon do the rainfall simulator? Okay. Okay. I'm going to show you how... You know, I, I hate to outdo Marlon. Uh, Marlon's in the back. Marlon, I got one up on you. So we parked a sprinkler dead still. We put a four-foot ring in the ground. We used an old wagon wheel and, and added to that. And we put on seven inches setting still. And we measured the rain gauges right there in a farm that's in 12 years in my system now, 
And if, if I could zoom in on that gauge, I could show you that it's fixing to run over at six inches. And we went ahead and put another on. And how did we do that? If you'll see there on the one sprinkler where the we got the pipe wrench and shovel, we got a GoPro camera there, and we got another GoPro over on the ground where we could watch it raining and watch how our soil was functioning. And if you look at that picture, you see no standing water or no runoff water. How many of you today could put seven inches on and have no surface water or no runoff water? I couldn't 12 years ago. I'll just tell you that because I could only put on about a half inch to seven tenths and then water was running everywhere because my infiltration rate was half inch an hour back in them days. So here it is, we shut it, it off, and you'll see just outside the, 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 the ring up there in the very top, there was a little bit, bitty puddle right there. It was the only thing. The gauge is still over full at six inches, and we just shut it off. And then we took the shovels and we dug down, and, and it had done went down about five foot deep. Rainfall simulator, big time scale. Now our next project is this, this come and grow season. We're gonna see really how much the profile will hold. So people tell you that Oklahoma is, is red. It is, that's from my neighbor's farm. That's our farm on the other side. And this is looking through a pro scope that you can get for 140, 50 bucks the snaps on your phone or iPad, and you can get about 200 power. See my soil aggregates over there on the, on the left? Can you imagine when water goes to falling down through there? See them cracks and crevices? How porous that is? Versus over here? See, that's when we really start understanding how that soil is. If I poured water out on this podium right here, you know what it would do? It would run off. But if I poured it in that cushion on that seat, would it all run off? Anybody want to set in that after a bit? <laughs> See, we got to think about the armor on the ground. So then my soil scientist, Doug, and this was the changing, this is what really lit the fire under Jimmy. It's when we dug this up. And I'm going to show you a difference here uh, in the next slide. But the dark soil is the top now. And the lighter red and sandy soil there is, is down below. I actually just like about five or six inches being down to the original plow pan of loading my soil with carbon and changing the whole structure. And now they've reclassified my soil from a used to flu vent to a mollick. And actually I'm, I'm two numbers darker than I need to be to be a mollick. That's what my surface looks like. That's what my subsurface looks like. I zoomed in on a little bit more. But now if you really look down in the bottom, you see the darkening happening, and that's from the earthworms. That's how important earthworms are because they're continually moving that soil and churning it for us as, as well as the other microbiome that's doing that. Folks, we can do this. If I can do it, y'all can do it because I'm not that smart. I just know that if we can keep a living root now and put that diversity in there, that things go to working. Here's another one, shows you a little bit different shot, how the darkness is in pockets and how the biology moves that around. So the original soil survey was mapped as a used to flu vent, like I said. These are very young soils, typically didn't have a very dark surface. And Steve didn't see that eight years ago. He saw a very light surface. And today I see a dark soil that we can call a mollick, so now we can reclassify that as a fluventic hapta soil. And what that means is my soil organic matter has grown, my carbon level has grown, my aggregation has grown. 
so it's starting to function in the way it was originally designed before we destroyed it. You know, there's more to a pie than just the crust. My mom always talked about, is the, is the crust flaky? What about the crust? Is it too tough? Is it tender? Is it flaky? It's like, heck, Mom, I don't care. I want what's in the middle. <laughs> so there's more to it than that. So how important is soil aggregation to soil health? Well, folks, it's everything. It's the beginning uh, with improved infiltration, water holding capacity, carbon storage. I just showed you that and more nutrients. If we get an eight or 10 inch rainfall and we can take it all in or at least most of it, it provides multiple benefits for future crops to grow water with, nutrients in the field, it doesn't go down the stream and my soil stays in place. You know my, what I really like to say now to my neighbors when we get a big rainfall event, they say, Jimmy, how much rain did you get? All of it. And they said, what? I said, yeah, I got it all. Oh, bull. Oh, really? Come over. We can do this. Let me help you. Huh. I got, I got four inches. Did you? How much left? Well, I had, I had a few terraces broke, and, you know, I run a little out. So how much did you really get? See, I, I used to never think that either because I had that mindset that, you know, it's the way it is. We can't change it. So, can we control runoff with organic matter? If you have a 2% soil organic matter, and, and some of you probably don't, I didn't start with, I started on that farm uh, that I just showed you at four tenths to a half percent of one. So very low, very sandy. But for today, we're gonna say that can hold 32,000 gallons of water what does that really mean? That 21% of a moderate to heavy rainfall is all you're going to capture. That means 80% is leaving. Now, if you're in an environment that we're in right now, I want that 80%. I don't want 20. I want it all. So if we can increase that to 5%, now we can hold 80,000 gallons of water. Or... 53% of that moderate to heavy rainfall event. And if we could really, really change things and get to an 8%, which you really have to work to do that, 128,000 gallons or 85%. Look what you can do going from only holding 20% to 80%. Irrigation efficiency rainfall efficiency and Dr. Alan Williams done that study in, in 2016. So what do I do? Marlon talked about triticale yesterday. That's on the left. Cereal rye. I started growing cereal rye in wheat country. That's the reason I wear bright clothes sometimes. Big target. I couldn't go to the coffee shop to get my Dr. Pepper. People say, what in the world are you doing? You're going to contaminate the entire planet. Well, we won't be able to give our wheat away. And I told him, I said, not if I'm a good steward. Not if I put a boundary around my fields that won't let it move out. If I'm really particular about my combine and I blow it off in the field before I move down the road. If I tarp my trucks and make sure we don't have a leak and be a good steward, just like I am a steward of the soil, it won't be a problem. Took them four years. They talked about tar and feather several times. But so far, I've only walked out into two producer fields and pulled a couple of heads of rye. And I'm sure that's a rodent or a, or a bird that has moved that over. But I'm a good steward. I stopped and grabbed it. And that there was a shovel. That's what we want. We want that armor. Marlon talked about that yesterday, how important that is. If you have armor like that, you will not have weeds. I guarantee you will not have weeds because they have to have sunlight to grow. 
This is some double crop corn. Where I'm at, if I'm going to grow corn, and the only reason I started growing corn because they said, <laughs> you can't grow corn. It gets too blooming hot around here. Once again, they were right. If you plant corn early like everybody wants to in my area, then it's 100, 110, 115 degrees when it's pollinating, and it's a zero. But what if we go ahead and harvest that cereal rye and plant July 15th with 100-day corn or 90-day corn? We can be very successful with that. We got the armor on the ground to do that. I also grow some heirloom, some Jimmy Red. I don't know why I like that. I, I like, you know, they, now the big thing is Jimmy Crack Corn, of course. Uh, and then that's some uh, other heirloom there, uh, Tommy Boy in the middle. Um, you'll see in that, that one slide here in the middle, we've got a rye coming. If I harvested that rye, right here with the combine, why would I want to throw some out the back of the combine for my next cover crop? You see that coming there with some crabgrass as well in there. And when we're done harvesting and I'm ready to graze corn stalks with my cows or my yearling calves, I had some yearling calves that winter they gained four pounds a day because I had some grain, I had some dry forage, and a lot of green. We started growing sunflowers because they're very water efficient. I use a lot of companions with my sunflowers. I use companions with my grain sorghum as well because if you really get to noticing, we all do better if we have a team, and companions are a team. You just don't want to plant a companion that's going to overcompete for your cash crop. You want something that'll stay down in the low story. And how did I learn that? With my partnerships for learning. My state conservationist, Gary O'Neill's kneeling down there looking at, at my wheat growing. It's got red clover in it. That's my state resource conservationist there in my local DC with the sunglasses on. This is Greg Scott, my soil scientist. He's retired now, I've got a new one. But what, you know, guess what? He was training Steve for a long time and so they've both been a part of it, so it's really good. There in the blue, that's Jim Johnson of Noble Research. That's Alan Miniman, at where the water pit was a while ago, the soil pit. OSU is coming out. My, and the guy in the white shirt used to be my, my crop consultant and sold me chemicals and fertilizer. He still sells me soil amendments and what fertilizer I need, but he's one of my biggest fans of how we can do more with less. This was at a field day, this is some residue, uh, and we were limited rainfall at that time, and we had terminated that. We weren't gonna graze it because we were very uh, moisture, moisture uh, deficient. And here's a, a bunch from John Deere. So my, my regional guy is on the right, my salesman and friend that I grew up with for years, Jimmy's there in, in the blue, my neighbor, Roger Oman, that helps me some, and then Joby over here on the left. Joby is working on technology 15 years to our future. So why would they be at, at my farm? Trying to improve drills and planters in high residue out there actually looking. And I wished I could tell you what they're working on because it's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome and, and things that they're working on. Soil health specialists, Ray Archuleta and Willie Durham. Willie is the only guy I know that can read any sleep. <laughs> if Willie ever calls me, it's three hours unless he's got to call Marlon. And normally he calls me after he's talked to Marlon. You know, it's very important to have them guys and, and use them anytime you get an opportunity. Here's one of our big field days. That's Keith Burns, Green Cover, and Jim there. And what are we doing? We're identifying 20 of the species in my mix. 
and why I planted them and what the benefits for them are. And I tell you, I won't plant anything if it doesn't have at least two benefits, and I like three. So as you're building your mixes, as you start learning, you got to think, like, why am I planting buckwheat? Is it for the flower to attract the beneficials, or is it for the phosphorus that it's leaking out? It's, it's chemical that dissolves the phosphorus that makes it available. Or is it another living root? Or is it because it's 30 days, 40 days, and it's done? Multiple benefits. Then you can take to the road. Rick Bieber in South Dakota, a good friend of mine. Rick farms 40,000 acres, and, he, and he's in a dry area too. The Pope of Soil Health, Jay Fuhr. I, I love Jay. I've been up there to mo uh, the, the, the farm several times in the last four or five years, and I've been quite honored. Gabe Brown, Gabe and I are good friends. Been to his farm several times looking at chickens in his soil up there. Darren Williams at Waverly, Kansas. Them's pretty good soybeans. Pretty good soybeans. And then Dr. Dwayne Beck. Dwayne's the one that helped me get started no-tilling in 95. And Dwayne and I learned a lot since that day of what we can do with covers and interceding and relays. Adam Doherty in Manchester, Tennessee, the little Iowa of Tennessee. Adam has changed his entire county, his entire county in the amount of covers that they grow and the crops that they can grow in there. And he's actually at spreading out of his county now, trying to help other DCs and NRCS. So we're not telling you about root exudates. You know, what, what do they look like? And, and I got real lucky a few years ago, and we were digging in some soil in some Elbon rye, and we run across this Elbon rye going across a big earthworm burrow. And I got to look, and if you look up there at the top, you start seeing like little droplets on these roots. And it's like, wow, that looks like dew almost. But see, this is, this is below ground where I dug up a shovel. Yesterday, I kept digging a little deeper out in there, and I started finding earthworms because I seen some activity up above, but they said there was no earthworms in this field. I said, well, let's look a little more. Sometimes you got to dig a little deeper to understand the system. And so I zoomed in on it, and this is what it looked like. You will never see a root exudate in soil because you can't, because the soil and the microbiome is consuming it. Only in this rare case where it was growing across that earthworm burrow and it was exposed could you see that. And it really helped me learn when people talk about exudates and how it takes sunlight in, comes down through the plants, and then it feeds out through the roots to the soil biome and says, here you go. Here's what you need to work for me. Then we started seeing more fungi start happening. Saprophytic, growing, growing wild. It's the connect. Remember yesterday, if you was at the field aid and you saw Marlin get the, the, the fishing string out and showed how that, that fungi works? This is what it looks like. That hair net he put over, that's what it looks like below ground. He wasn't just trying to fun you. He was really showing you how it really works. Pot worms. How many of you have ever saw a pot worm that are truly transparent? If you see he's trying to eat that soil particle, and you can see the chunks to start with, but the further down, they start transitioning. And what comes out the back is really, really, really good. Dr. Buzz Clute says sometimes it's just overwhelming life below ground. We know so much to know so little. And that is so true. And, and, and really, if you right there where that arrow was pointing, we had, had a, a little jeweler's glass and we were looking at the surface. 
his buzz flopped over and I just couldn't resist to take that picture. So you've heard me talk a lot about what we've been able to do and, and, and I know that it's a big stretch but I'm gonna show you now some friends of mine that I've been helping over the last few years and they were caught some amazing photos I'm gonna share with you to prove to you that, that it's not just Jimmy's hype and I'm not trying to fill you full of something that's not true. So this next set of photos is from producers and this first one is gonna be Russ Jackson in Mountain View, Oklahoma. Russ heard me originally at No Till on the Plains in 2015 in 2016, and, and I guess it sunk in. And, and you never know when you're a speaker like this, you know, how you connect with people. But Russ went back home and wanted to try what I was doing. And then he sent me this picture. And then we put the numbers to the picture. We had been to his farm on the left over there. This is the neighbors on the right. And we had measured water infiltration rates in his field the week before this rainfall event of six inches an hour that he could take in. And he got a 5.3 inch rainfall event and he called me and said, Jimmy, you won't believe this. He said, I have no standing water, had no runoff water and my neighbor's in a flood situation. It's running past the neighbor's house through a tin horn into the river. Russ, with no-till cover crop rotation, cover crop, plan grazing and management, remember, with an infiltration rate of six inches an hour, when you got a 5.3 inch, he took in almost 144,000 gallons an acre of water. His neighbor, with a half inch an hour, like I used to be, with no management, conventional tillage, small grains, no cover crops, no grazing, <laughs> took in 16,500 gallons. Now, remember that statement I said a while ago when they said you can't do it because we don't have enough rainfall? And they were right. They were. But now, I think Russ is right. And look at this photo. You notice anything different on Russ's side of the road from here to here? You see any difference? It's more green. You know why? Because it rained then, and two weeks later, he got another one. And what happened? He took it all in. He started to say, I got it all, Jimmy. And look over on the neighbors. If you notice there, it's more prolific today than it was then. Because it sealed off. And he had just put down dry fertilizer getting ready to plant wheat. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. Can you imagine paying $1,000 a ton, $1,500 a ton, and watch it go past your house to the river? So what did Jimmy do? I got in a pickup, and I went the next morning. It's still running out of the field down the road, look at the surface. What would it do if it rained again this afternoon? Look in the bar ditch at the color of the water. It's loaded. Look at Russ's in the cover crop. Maybe we can do it, huh? So then this year, Mark and Annette Thomas, I've been helping Mark and Annette. They live about 120 miles north of Russ, uh, about 60 miles east of me. Uh, we went there the day before this rain event. Uh, I worked for the Soil Conservation Service, the Conservation Commission there in Oklahoma part-time as a mentor. And I took my team, I took Greg Scott, the soil scientist out there, and, and Meg Gresky, our grazing lady. And uh, we, we couldn't hardly dig, dig a hole. It was so blooming hard and dry, I mean dry. And they had been seeding uh, their winter triticale in, and they were able to get it in. They had sharp blades. And the next morning after we left, Mark called me and he said, Jimmy, you won't believe 
it's been raining all morning and we're up to six inches already and it, it looks like it's gonna be some more. On the left is his neighbor. That day we were there, they were still harrowing, getting ready to plant. It was just dust and powder. Mark's planted over here in the cover crop. And the only reason there's water in this bar ditch in this field is because it ran across the road right there where I'm standing and took this picture. This is another quarter of his down the road. Mark's on the right. The neighbors are on the left. Side by side. Remember that slide when I said it's more about management and commitment? If you're committed to take the heat at the coffee shop and plant cereal rye and do foolish things that people call trash farming and it'll never work, if you're a limited rainfall, I'm telling you who's, who I'm going to bet on. And then Mark and I got in the bar ditch and we scooped up the water running out of the field. And Mark had just a little because it rained eight inches. Remember I said you can take, you might not can take it all in in a big event. He did run a little bit out. But he's only been doing this four and five years. So he's not near there yet. Our, our, our friends and our consumers that we sell food to, if they saw this picture, what would you think they would think? When we talk about, you know, the Gulf of Mexico, the Chesapeake Bay, the Snake River, all them streams that we've loaded with nutrients and soil, folks, we've done that. I've done that. We can do better. This next video is a good friend of mine from North Dakota. He's a fellow alumni of the Leopold Award like I am, Jeremy Wilson. Maybe, Marlon, do you know Jeremy? Okay. So Jeremy called me. It rained 14.8 inches of rain in one rainfall event. folks that's my yearly rainfall and when I say give or take all of it I mean it can happen and so he went out and shot this video for me look how clean the water is leaving his field his profile is full and it's swept some of the residue away but that's not a ditch it's just a low area not eroding. Some of my poor residue fields. His poor residue fields, what he's saying. Still aggregated and holding. But well, it's aggregated. It's clear it's run off. Off. took a drink of it. <laughs> it tastes really good. <laughs> Can we hold it all? Not when the bucket's full, the bucket's full. But look how much he held before it started leaving. And when it did leave, it was clean. No soil. He lost a little residue. But in these big hurricane events, weather events like that, and this whiplash weather, we're going to see that. And we need to do better, and we can do better. And I think I've showed you a picture that's just not all about Jimmy. It's been about the team I've been able to work with that I'm so blessed to have worked with them. And then the friends of mine that listened and took the leap of faith and that big commitment that maybe we can do better. And I don't understand where you guys are that it's challenging. The more drier it is, the challenger it is to grow something. And Marlon said this better than, than, than I could say it yesterday. A little green plant can do more than you think. It can create nitrogen. It can, it can feed that biology. It can keep that alive. We didn't have to be six foot or 10 foot tall to do some good. And in these environments, sometimes we got to settle for this. And then if we get a rain, we can settle for this. 
or snow or more irrigation water. How many of you like westerns, western movies? I love them. I got my grandson, eight years old. He loves John Wayne. I love John Wayne. How do you stop a runaway stagecoach? How, how do you think John Wayne stopped the runaway stage? He went from A to B to C to D to E to F and saved the day, jumping and jumping and saving it. And folks, that's the way we've always done it. Do you ever think they talked about doing it any other way? No. But is there another way? <laughs> now, I'm not advocating kill the horses. <laughs> he used a taser. They're all right. <laughs> I'm just trying to show you that there is another way. And I'm sure at the end of the shoot that day that John Ford and John Wayne, they always had a bourbon after they shot or two, or six, they never said, well, Duke, tomorrow, you know, I was thinking, if you just shoot the horses, we'd save risk in your life, and, and same results, uh, what do you think? No, they didn't, because they were ingrained in the way they always had done it. Plan A, or plan B? You know, we get to choose. Sometimes we're carrying the answer with us. We just don't look in the right places for it. It's right in front of us. We've got to understand that, that soil structure was here to begin with. And me, I destroyed it. I helped my granddad and dad. Did we know that? No. No, we didn't. Would we have stopped if we did? I did. When I figured it out, and now I got more water to work with. That's so important. It's so, so important to understand how the system works and how we fix it and how we repair it. But you know the hard part? It's in between these two. It's, it's just like the stagecoach. I never thought of what I was doing. I never thought I was wasting that water. Never thought about it. And I don't know how I am on time, Tony. Got 30 minutes left? We're going to have some great conversation. See, I don't like to talk for an hour and a half and give you all a chance to answer or give me a question. One. I'm going to leave you with this, then we're going to do questions. Long live the soil. I drove by this corner post probably two weeks before I finally stopped. And I tell everybody, my soil health is so good now that I can grow plants on my corner post. <laughs> See, we think that we've got to till and we've got to fertilize and we've got to manipulate things to be successful. Nobody plowed the top of that post. Mother Nature started eroding it away, and a seed come along and flew in there, maybe by a bird, maybe by the wind, and something grew. And long live the soil means it better. Lots of civilizations, if you read history, have come and gone because they de destroyed their soil. Franklin Roosevelt told us if we destroy it, we destroy our nation. And we ignored that. We've done better, but man, we're not there. I'm going to leave you with that, and let's take some questions from the crowd. We've got plenty of time. In the back, sir. The hardest thing is to admit I was wrong. How many of us men driving down the road when we're lost and the wife says, won't you just call somebody or pull it up on the phone? <laughs> oh, I'm not lost. 
I know where I'm at. I'm in Kansas. I just can't figure out where I'm going. I really think that's embedded more than, than we realize. And then it's like my father-in-law, 80 years old. He, uh, he hired me to plant some covers with him and saw some success. And then he wanted to, to buy a drill, and he went and priced a drill in, like, sticker shock. And he said, I, I, I'm just not, I'm 80 years old. I'm not going to spend that much money for a, a new drill. And I said, what did they offer you for your, your tillage equipment? Huh. What do you mean? Uh, uh, that's a brand new chisel. I've just barely used it a couple years. And, and my wife, Ginger, said, well, Daddy, I thought you were done tilling. Well, I am. <laughs> so why wouldn't you want to trade, trade that chisel in? He never thought of it. Took him a week or two. He finally went back. And he, and he traded a chisel and his drill off and two or three other things that he'd taken good care of that was worth some money and got into a no-till drill for around $15,000. And then all at once, it was a number that he could digest. Some of it's pressure, peer pressure, and that could be uh, a, from an alumni of a college that you went to. Colleges are, are, are still not teaching this. They're trying, they're, they're trying to start looking, but they're not there yet. So I think there's lots of obstacles, but it's education and learning. And, and, and quite truthfully, I see women. I see in Oklahoma, we have a lot of, of, of widow women now that get it. I think women get it quicker than we do because women are willing to change. They want to change the color of the paint in the house. They want to change the... The, the 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 recipe, you know, I want chicken fried steak and potatoes, maybe mashed potatoes and gravy. That's the two rotations I like. <laughs> <laughs> Women want to try a new recipe. The youth that, that are not first generation farmers, they get it. So I think it's heritage. I think it's mindset. I think it's peer pressure. I think it's the mind that I've done it wrong. That was hard for me. All them moisture probes and stuff I pulled was really to prove to me to start with. And then when I saw the data, it's like, gosh, I get it.
Well, and that's the reason I tried, like yesterday, who was in my group uh, when we were out digging and found the earthworms? Okay. That's what my excitement is now, to show the life below ground. And so that's the reason I got to look a little deeper and, and, and find that. And I, I thought it was pretty exciting to, to see them and understand them. We found them in the alfalfa field as well. So now I try to focus that, that feel-good feeling from, from tilling to look at what you're creating. You're creating life. It's like your first child. Look at that over there. Yeah, and so when I talk about addiction, and, and, and tilling is an addiction, but also your soul is addicted to the chemicals and the synthetics that we've used. And any time you take a, a, a per say, take me, if I was an alcoholic and had drank heavily over the years and you took alcohol away from me, what does my body start to do immediately? The soil's the same way because it's alive too and you're taking its dependency away and it has this t a, a tendency to pull in and tighten up. That's the reason I said it's hard because there's a transition period that you got to go through. It may be one year, it may be three years, it may be four or five years of that soil starting to transition as you take that away. And so what I recommend is do not, do not, hear me, go cold turkey. It won't work. You've got to start weaning. That's the reason I'm still at 85% because I'm still weaning some of my soils off of that and giving it, you got to get that life and get that cycle to going. And that's the reason it's hard because we want to be an instant country we, we or countries we want instant gratification right now. We want to throw fertilizer, seed, and water out there, and we want to see a crop grow now. And we want to harvest it now. This is a process, and it's, it's, a, it's, it's not instant. It starts, but we not being able, or not used to looking at it with a shovel. Marlon talked about it yesterday. Jay Fuhr preaches this all the time. Learn how to read your shovel. Dig and watch and see that change. And it is. In them, in them high pH soils, as that tightens up, then, then it's more harder to get water in to start with. But that's where a living root and another plant comes into play. And then you start getting the earthworms. And the biology starts coming. And then pores start opening up. But it's not going to happen the first summer. And, and it's more challenging and it's hard in these arid environments because sometimes we don't have enough water to grow like we want to grow other than a cash crop. And it's that mindset that's hard that I'm focused on this cash crop. And we really need to focus on the cover crops just like we do a cash crop. And so it, it is difficult. Yeah. You know, you can see a yield drag if you don't manage right and you let that cover crop grow too long in them first years. Like I said, in water management a while ago, you may have to take them out instead of exhausting all that water out. And it's a learning process. You can't just let it grow if you're limited. If you've got some extra water and you can get it up and get it growing, 
if it doesn't have to be tall to do a lot of good. So it, it's no easy thing other than just management and being patient and staying the course. But you got to understand, if you do it a little wrong, just like any other input, you might have a, a yield drag if you if you miss the cor corner to start with. And that's the reason I always say start slow, start small, and do side by side comparisons. Don't go whole hog and do the whole farm. Do, do 10, 20 acres, five acres, whatever you can stand and side by side and learn from that and start watching and you can start seeing the change and, and it'll become easier. So I used technology in, in the first years with moisture probes and stuff so I could kind of watch where my, my water draw was and where we were at. And, and so I knew, you know, we were drawing too much water and that, and that grazing trial showed us that. Uh, but I knew my aggregation was getting better. And so when we done a little water infiltration test, we, were, we could tell we were gaining. It was getting better. So I wanted to stay the course. And so termination, we've done it all. We, we've done chemicals, we've done roller crimping, we've done high stock density trampling, and all that depends on your goals that you set up first. If you're not a cattleman, high stock density or, or animals, it doesn't have to be just cattle, uh, that may not be an option. It might have to be chemicals. Or if you got a roller crimper or a neighbor or a conservation district, maybe that's an alternative. It's just things you gotta kinda figure out to go, and that's one skin how, when I talk about being hard, it's figuring some of this out early to start with and, and how we do that. And so management tools were the probes, NRCS, bringing the gettings out, taking that and looking at where the water is and, and understanding them side-by-side -side comparisons. What I didn't show you in that first slide where I showed three more inches of water was it was dry down to 16 inches where there was no cover crops. It was hard as a brick. Four feet over where there was cover crops, it was 34 inches to water. I mean, we had 34 inches of water in the profile and then it was hard and dry. I had nearly double because the evaporation of the bear. And so that's when I knew how important covers was. And that's when I started trying to manage that water and try to get it in when it did rain. Hope that makes sense. Any crop. Right, right. If I can get a cover crop to grow 35, 40 days, I'm, I'm good. 45 is better, but I, past that, I, I'm good. I mean, that's just extra and then I can graze it or whatever. So let, let it do the most it can do, but if you're in a water deficit, you may have to terminate. But you still got some cover, whether it's this tall or this tall, to protect that surface and, and help that aggregation. I'll get you a minute right here. Sure, so, and I'm gonna talk about that this afternoon in my breakout session. But once again, we look at our goals and what we have, where we have cows and calves, or we have weaning calves, or I want to wean calves there. What we really like to do now is plant a warm season mix, put the cows and calves out there, and let them graze about 10 days and get the calves used to grazing, and, the, and then just pull the cows out and wean them right there. The health is so much better. And then we, we got to know how much we have to graze. And so NRCS worked with me early on in the years to come out and help me measure and weigh to figure out how much biomass we had, whether it was 5,000 pounds or 10,000. And we knew we were gonna take half and leave half. It, actually, the first two or three years, we took 25 and left 75 because we were wanting to build. So you gotta know how much you got and then agree how much you're gonna take. Then you'd look at your animals and say, I got a 1,000 pound cow, she's gonna eat you know, 30 pounds a day because she's gonna eat 3% of her body weight on average. So uh, 30 pounds a day, and then you'll know how many cows you got, 
and then I can kind of tell you how big a paddock you can build. And then you graze the first day or two, and then you look and say, I'm taking too much or I'm not taking quite enough. And then you can adjust that paddock size. And then as you go through that, it's growing every day. And so you may have to shrink your paddock size down because you're growing more biomass. You may want to leave it the same and just put more back. So it's kind of a, a, a work in progress in the numbers. But now I can actually take and look at a cover crop because it's like weighing a chicken or a cow. If you do enough of it, pretty soon you can say, that, that's a 400 pound calf and you can be pretty close. And I can look at a cover crop and look at its density and its height and say, that's about 2,500 pounds. So if I got 1,200 pounds here, this is what I wanna do. So I don't always have to weigh and measure like I used to because I got good enough with, with what God give us here in these eyes to, to try to manage that. So it's kind of a work in progress. And then if I, <coughs> my goals, if I'm finishing calves, I want to move daily or multiple times a day because you just want them to take that first bite of that really good stuff in the high bricks level to really put the finish on them. Just like finishing, mixing a ration in a grain fed, how you manage that ration the same way in the forage. So it's multiple things you got to work through. But once again, it's pretty easy once you kind of get down to it. In the back there. Well, I've got some high too. I've got some eights, eight, two or threes. So <clears throat> once the system gets to cycling and gets to working, it starts adjusting the pH. You, you can do some things to start with, with low pH, high pH is a bigger challenge. But as you, you know, Ray Archuleta says it's the best. It's amazing what a root and plants can do. As that starts cycling and gets to working on its own, we see them pHs come back and they will actually get to, to, to neutral. It's not, it's not fast and Jill's sitting right behind you and she's shaking her head yes. We see that, don't we, Jill? In, in, in a system, it has the ability to fix itself if we let it and, and keep that living root in there. It's just a slow process. You, you gotta remember, we didn't raise that pH in a year or two or three. It, it took a while or we didn't lower it quickly either. So it's not gonna rebound and get back to neutral quickly. But I, I would say within five or seven years, we've about got to neutral in them high pH soils and we raise some low ones up to a manageable level. Sure, and there's more testing on Jill Clapton's with us. She's working on a lot of uh, different 
technology to help us look more. But you're absolutely right. I mean, the hyphae is, is a very, very important to how it connects all together and how it shares and how we build that soil and that life. Then, as I said earlier, that helps start fixing that problem, making that available to that to start re releasing that and start fixing that. It just takes a while, but it will do it. If you look in Mother Nature outside where it's never been tilled and you look at pH levels, they're, they're, they're pretty good. And, and, and we see that. And so I think it's just a matter of time and get, keeping them living plants in there. But talk to us in the break a little bit more over here. You know, <clears throat> Dr. Rick Haney will tell you that, that some tillage is not the worst thing you can do. And, and, and early on, if, if you got to do a little light tillage or something, that's okay. Remember, the principle says minimize disturbance. Even though I'm a complete no-tiller, there's times that i got to do a little maintenance for feral hogs or different issues. So a little bit of iron, if you need it, to get the system going. And we talked about this in the field yesterday. If you have a compaction layer that is 300 PSI or higher, we know a root can't go through that. And so there might be something that, that you would have to do, something to alleviate that to get a living root through that the first time or two to start fixing the problem. So. Yes, there, there's lots of things. You've listed a lot of tests there that you can look at. But digging and looking with your eyes and a shovel is the best thing you can do to understand that. And if you have that layer that you cannot penetrate, then there is some things that you might could do with tillage to fix that in the short period. But even if you rip that up, it's not going to be fixed more than about a year or two because it's going to collapse back on itself. But if you can get a root through that and get growing and get the earthworm started and let them and the biology start tilling that for you, then you can get away from that. And that's that weaning process I was talking about. I, I, you can. When I when I go out on the consultation, when I walk in a field, I can pretty well tell it within a little bit some of the issues they've got, whether you feel that or it feels like it's solid concrete, and then we can go to making some suggestions from there. So you're going, and this is a tough one, you're going to have to quit hauling off everything uh, because you're taking the residue out that, that builds the structure and holds it apart. And, it, you know, you've got to find a way that cover crop or some living root will pay you a return back, whether it's grazing management or something else or feeding some of that back on the same place you took it off. And I know that doesn't fit a lot of, a lot of operations, especially in silage and whatnot, or dairies, but manure back, you know, compost back. You, you, that's the reason I was talking about mother nature never hauls off. And that's the reason it's so good. And especially if you're double hauling off everything, then, then, 
you're hauling so much out that it has no ability to feed itself, it, plus all the compaction from the trucks and stuff. Compaction will go away if you got the residue and the soil structure. That's a tough one to break out of that, but you're going to have to find a way to create revenue off the cover crops and other things in grazing or something to, or take a little bit less if you're going to gain because if you continue to take it all, it's going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. In the back. Sure, Jill and I talked about that before, and I, I don't know, she may talk about that some this afternoon. She is, she will. But yes, if you can build some diversity into that mix, into that corn silage or triticale, where you have more living roots, you gotta understand below ground, and we talked about this the other day in, in Idaho, and we talked a little bit about in the field yesterday, if you have a plant that doesn't have much root mass, if it's a lagoon, and it, it only has a big tap root and stuff, it doesn't have much work going on below ground. But a grass species that has millions or hundreds of roots can do a lot to fix that below ground. So the more diversity you can build in the ration, and actually the ration will get better with the diversity. We think that it's just gotta be corn or triticale, but if you can get the diversity in there and improve the feed quality, the, the dairies and all will really like that if you can get them past that point. But it also builds more roots in the ground and, and building that diversity is really keen too, as well. One more. This has been great, folks. Really has. One more? Right there. We're just getting ready to start in some perennials. We really think, and there's several people across the country will tell you if you really want to build soil health quickly, it's with a perennial. It will, it will, because once again, you're hauling it all off. <clears throat> and and you, to build soil health, you can't haul it all off. It doesn't matter. I've got neighbors that will graze their wheat into the ground and then farm it all year. And then they'll plant something and they'll graze it in the ground. It doesn't have to be silage, it doesn't have to be hay. It can be grazing, the same thing. And so you have to limit that haul off. The perennials where they're really gonna work good is let a perennial pasture grow two, three, four years, and then do some cropping systems in that. But you all, you gotta be in the ranching business to do that and graze in perennials. And so that becomes challenging if you're just in a farming operation. So we're, we're looking at putting perennial alfalfas and clovers in Bermuda grass. Besides our cool seasons that we, we try to put in that, to give that perennial aspect to that and then graze that and you know, maybe hay some of that once in a great while, but once again, let it fix the soil as an amendment instead of something that we can grab and haul off. So that's the part I was talking about is hard, it is all these questions, and you can see, it, it, you, you tend to say, well, that's gonna be too much, but it's really not if you get in that systems approach and try to solve one problem at a time and try to fix what's going wrong instead of saying, that's not gonna work, I'm just gonna go back to my old ways. And that's what I wanna leave with, with everybody today. Appreciate it, come back to, uh, this afternoon. We've got great breakout sessions. I'm gonna be doing one on grazing and profits and others, and, and you can't wait to hear Jill tomorrow in her grand opening session too. So thanks a lot. Thanks, Jimmy, and being patient with me. I appreciate that, too. So we, we, I do. I owe you big time. So, all right. So we're going to go into our lunch break. Uh, just if you go out these doors, go straight down to the exhibit hall.
lunch is there ready for you. I believe it's buffet style. So, you know, um, make sure though lunch is going to, we're going to resume at 1.30. So while you're there, take the time, talk to the vendors and everything as well. Spend some time networking. That's the other thing we want to encourage everybody to get to know each other and network. Okay, we we want this event to be something where you can meet people that are doing similar things, have questions. So, um, otherwise, we appreciate Jimmy and give him one more round of applause and let's go have some lunch. <laughs>